So now I'll be just rushing through a few of the interesting cases of uh, interventional pulmonology. The, it has been the craze for all pulmonologists about interventional pulmonology, but what you need to understand is pulmonology has more to offer and not just uh, interventional pulmonology. So this is one of the uh, major breakthroughs which has happened in the field of pulmonary medicine. As a pulmonologist, now you are expected to do at least to the level of an EBUS because this is a very basic test. So any structures which you have around your airways, be it a node or be it a mass or uh, be it a, uh, any sort of cystic lesions also, you can diagnose with the help of an endobronchial ultrasound. So I'm showing you this case. This lady was a 50-year-old female. She was not having any comorbidities. She was complaining of loss of weight, loss of appetite, and low-grade fever for two months. And incidentally, on evaluation, she was found to be HIV positive, and CD4 count is only 66 cells per microliter. And CT scan, as you can see from here, is suggestive of a subcarinal lymphadenopathy along with a right paratracheal lymphadenopathy. So anybody from the audience, what would you really think in this patient? How many of you think it is just a tuberculosis? Yeah. So how many of you here think it's tuberculosis? So you don't think like it's a tuberculosis? So this, that is the first thing you should be thinking in a country like India. When you have a HIV patient presents to you with mediastinal lymphadenopathy, so anybody has any other alternative diagnosis? So next you can think about multidrug resistant tuberculosis because the patient is having a HIV. So we also thought we are just dealing with a case of a tuberculosis or an MDR. So we did EBUS and on EBUS the pathologist saw this specimen. Anybody can say what it is, what you are seeing? So these are nothing but yeast cells which are found in the EBUS. And when you did the India ink stain on the EBUS material, you get the classical cryptococcus. So this is, these are extremely rare presentations of cryptococcus, which presents as a mediastinal lymphadenopathy. The point of putting this slide is to make you understand that not all lymphadenopathies are tuberculosis. And empirical tuberculosis treatment is not justified these days just because you have a lymph node. Any lymph node that is present, it has to be biopsied. And you, to, uh, you, you are seeing the cryptococcus here, but we had many other cases of NTM we had many other cases of burkholderia presenting as mediastinal lymphadenopathies. So all mediastinal lymphadenopathies should be biopsied and a particular diagnosis has to be made before you start these patients on particular treatment. This is yet another scenario where EBUS has really changed our practice. So this lady was a 60-year-old female. She was a post-hysterectomy. She was having bleeding per vagina. And PET-CT scan was done, which was suggestive of a mediast petavid mediastinal lymph node as well as petavid lesions in the vault of vagina. So from the vault of vagina, they took the biopsy. It came out as squamous cell carcinoma. They did a PET-CT scan, and after seeing the PET-CT scan, the oncologist said that the patient is having a pet-avid mediastinal lymphadenopathy, and uh, they ha she had to be put on a palliative care. So then the patient got referred, and then they came to us, and I was admitted in physician department, and then they gave us a cross-referral. So when we saw this, we found that there was a pet-avid mediastinal lymph node. So what generally happens in most of the peripheral setting is these patients are deemed as metastasis and they are put on palliative care. We said that we will take this patient for an EBUS and as you can see from here we are passing the needle into the node under guidance and we are taking sample and you get a granuloma and you get a gene expert positivity. So in this case a patient who was deemed as a palliative care will now become a curative care because now the patient does not have a metastatic disease. He, she is having two diseases which is coexisting. One cancer at the vault of vagina and another tubercular lymph node. This is a very, very common scenario. What I am showing is only like amongst the 15 cases, one of the cases I am showing you. In 15 cases, the EBUS really changed the management because whatever that was taken as pet avid node later came out to be tubercular node. So in India, it is very common and pet avidity does not mean you are dealing with a metastatic disease. You need to sample these nodes. You can find even tuberculosis, fungal infection in these nodes and that changes the entire management for the patient. In addition to this, now the interventional pulmonology has expanded much further. Previously, when you see a nodule like this in the lung, most of the time these are placed as incidental pulmonary nodules and they are kept under observation. And after three months, you repeat a CT scan. And after six months, you go for another repeat scan. And by that time, probably the patient goes in for a metastatic disease. So now with the advancements in the technology, we have multiple things. So this guy was a 45-year-old male and he was having a 1.1 centimeter nodule in the left upper loop. So previously these nodules were not approachable, but now we have many advanced techniques like a navigation bronchoscopy, which is just like your GPS map, will take you where exactly you have to go. And you use a radial probe EBUS, the image which you are seeing down, 
on to your right side is the radial probe ubus. You localize the lesion, you take the biopsy, and on table your pathologist gives the diagnosis whether you are dealing with a malignancy or tuberculosis. In this case, the patient came out to be a malignancy lesion, staging ebus was done, and lobectomy was done the very next day, and the patient was sent home. So probably before this, these technologies were not available, so we used to observe these nodules, and by the time we really make a diagnosis of cancer, he's already in stage four. But with advancements in the technology and interventional pulmonology, you can even sample nodules as low as one centimeter, so that you pick the malignancies immediately and you provide a complete curative intent treatment for these patients. In addition to this, this I'm skipping a few of the slides. So this is one of the very interesting cases which we did in, when I was in a Malakpet uh, Institute. So the, this lady was a 52-year-old female. She was a case of ovarian carcinoma. And as you can see from the CT scan here, there is a small nodule which is about one centimeter in the left lower loop. So now the oncologist is confused whether he is dealing with a case of a metastatic node, metastatic nodule, or is it a case of an infective. This becomes a very, very important thing because if it is a metastatic now, he has to go in for another cycle of chemotherapy. So previously, these nodules used to be very, very difficult. If you go by CT-guided, high chances of pneumothorax, and probably you may not be able to get the sample which for nodules as small as one centimeter. So what we do these days is what we refer to as the cone beam assisted lung biopsy. Just like our ca on, uh, cardiology colleagues and interventional radiology use a CT scan while doing their procedures, pulmonologists have also started using the CT scan. So while doing bronchoscopy, we, may, we, we keep the patient in a CT console room, we do the bronchoscopy. Now you can see that this is how we are doing. We are doing the bronchoscopy and the cone beam CT is there and it clearly shows us where the nodule is. Now you can see the nodule being marked in the cone beam CT. And once it is done, we pass a radial probe, we see the lesion, we take the biopsy under the presence of a CT guidance, unlike a CM guidance which we routinely do for a bron uh, routine bronchoscopy. So we are taking the biopsies from here and luckily in this patient, it turned out to be a case of an inflammatory lesion and after six months of follow-up with routine treatment with antibiotic, the patient had a resolution of the nodule. So the point of putting this is like, you should not, now we are not in a time where we just say that we will observe. Many of these nodules, you have accessories to reach these nodules and to really make a difference in the life of the patients. Another thing which has gained recent prominence uh, is the role of the bronchoscopy in the management of tracheal stenosis. So this is how we generally do a uh, repair of the tracheal stenosis. So you can see the, so this is very, very important why the point of putting this is not to brag that we have done a procedure. This is something which can be avoided. If you are very careful with your manometry pressures or proper tracheostomy care, most of these post-intubation and post-tracheostomy stenosis can be avoided because do, um, correcting it is a very, very major issue. For example, if you see this patient here, this patient had a tracheostomy, and now when you go inside with a bronchoscopy and see, you cannot see the trachea only. The entire airway lumen is completely covered by a fibrous tissue, which is a post-tracheostomy tracheal stenosis. So once this is done, what we generally used to do is, in few cases you can do surgical procedure, but in this case the length of the stenosis was very high and it was in the subglottic region. So you cannot do the surgery. So what we are doing is a bronchoscopic method for dilating the stenosis. So we are making electrosurgical nicks and we are opening up the airway. And as you can see from here, we are slowly opening up the airway and we are passing a balloon to dilate the tract. And once we have dilated the tract, through the tracheostomy site, we are, we are dilating the airway tract further. And as you can see from here, we are placing a Montgomery T-tube in situ. And once it is placed, now the patient is extubated on table and he can vocalize and he is discharged the very next day. So in certain cases of post-intubation and post-tracheostomy stenosis, your bronchoscopy can help in cases where surgery cannot be performed or patient is not willing for a surgery. So this is a very, very another interesting case which I wanted to show to all the residents here because this is something which you will face as a pulmonologist day in and day out. Patient comes to you, patient takes ATT, but patient persistently complains of breathlessness and cough. Most of the time we neglect the symptom, we say that you have completed the six months of ATT, so nothing to worry. So, but you see the patient here, this, this was the x-ray of the patient which was done two years back when the patient was having a sputum positive tuberculosis. Patient was started on ATT for six months, and after completion of the ATT, the patient started complaining of breathlessness and cough. And when the x-ray was done, there is a complete collapse of the left, lower, left lung. So patient went to multiple doctors, they tried bronchoscopy, they tried dilation, they could not dilate and the patient has become oxygen dependent. He was taking, ox his saturation was 83% and he was taking oxygen for almost one and a half years. 
By that time, after one and a half years, the patient came to us. So when we did a bronchoscopy, as you can see from here, there is nothing called as a left main bronchus. The entire, uh, th there is only one carina, there is no carina and it is directly entering into the right main bronchus. So what we do in such cases is, we did a complete recanalization of the left main bronchus. And as you can see from here, after one and a half years, the lung completely expanded. And after six months of follow-up, the left lung is completely saved. And a patient who was deemed to be oxygen dependent for life is not requiring oxygen anymore. But the point to be noted is this was not possible for us in every case. So many of the cases, what happens is the lung goes for secondary infection because of endobronchial stenosis. And you may be never able to recover the lung. So any patient of tuberculosis, when you start ATT and the patient consistently complains of cough or breathlessness, or you auscultate the patient and find monophonic V's, or you do a CT scan and you find that the lumen, airway lumen appears to be narrowed, you should suspect endobronchial TB. And endobronchial TB occurs in more than 50% cases of your routine pulmonary tuberculosis. And a bronchoscopic evaluation is a must, even though you have a sputum positivity for tuberculosis, if you suspect an endobronchial TB, because that is the point where you can dilate the airway and prevent the airway from going in for a complete stenosis and total bronchial cutoff. And even if you diagnose a patient with an endobronchial TB, give them ATT along with a short course of steroids so that you prevent the inflammation from occurring and probably you can save the life of the patient. And in, in India, any women with tuberculosis, especially young women who complains of cough and breathlessness, I always suspect because they are more prone to develop this endobronchial tuberculosis. In addition to this, your interventional pulmonology can play a major role in most of the palliative disorders. So this is a patient where you are seeing the patient is having a CA esophagus. And when you do a bronchoscopy, you see that tumor infiltrating into the airway. So I'll just show you here. So we do, when we do a bronchoscopy, now you can see that there is an entire infiltration of the uh, tracheal wall by the esophageal carcinoma, and it is causing a malignant tracheoesophageal fistula. This has to be addressed immediately because if you don't close the fistula, then probably this patient can have recurrent soiling of the lung and the patient may die of pneumonia. So what we are doing is we are using an electrosurgical instruments to burn the tissues which has eroded into that airway lumen. And once it is done, what we are doing now is called as a metallic airway stenting. Just like our cardiology colleagues have got stenting, we do have stents for the airways. So what we do is we put these metallic airway stents in place. And now you can see that once the stent is being completely deployed into the airway, the tracheal esophageal fistula is completely co closed and the airway patency is also restored. So now the patient will be sent for further radiation so that he can have a good quality of life as long as he survives. So similarly, for any cases of malignant esophageal fistula, the treatment of choice are your silicons or your metallic stents. But never put a metallic stent if you're dealing with a benign condition. For example, if you have an adenoid cystic carcinoma or if you have any patient who has got a tuberculosis bronco uh, tracheal fistula, do not put a metallic stent. Because the problem with the metallic stent is it will cause extensive granulation tissue. And once you put, it becomes very difficult for you to remove it. So simple dictum for all the postgraduate series, if you have malignancy, then yes, you are justified in putting a metallic stent. But if you have a benign lesion, never put a metallic stent. So now, and uh, one interesting case I will show you in uh, Plura, in the interest of the time, I'm rushing through a few of the slides. So she's a 40-year-old female. She was a hypertensive, hypothyroid. She was treated as a case of zero re negative rheumatoid arthritis for one year with steroids and methotrexate. Then patient came to us with low-grade fever, loss of weight, and loss of appetite for 15 days. So we examined the patient. The patient was having a gangrene of the right toe. ANA was positive, double-stranded DNA was positive, and proteinuria was three plus. So she was classically in a case of a SLE and along with a lupus flare, and she was having an end organ involvement in the form of renal manifestation. So we did the tapping of the fluid, and as you can see in the pleural fluid, we got the LE cells. So the rheumatologist was very much convinced that we are dealing with a case of a lupus pleuritis along with a lupus nephritis, and the patient is in an end organ damage, so he wants to start this patient on pulse steroid along with cyclophosphamide. So then they gave us the consult. So when we saw, it, somehow we were not convinced. Uh, generally in plural, uh, it is not that it is not possible. Generally in any sort of systemic lung disease, systemic diseases, you expect the pleural fluid to be bilateral. But in this case, the patient was having a unilateral pleural effusion. So we said that we wanted to do a thoracoscopy because we are not convinced, even though we had an LE cells in the pleural fluid. So we went ahead with the thoracoscopy and we took the biopsy. And what we got was a granuloma with a scanty necrosis. And as you can see from here, there is an AFB sitting inside the granuloma. 
So this is the world's first case report where there is a both tubercular pleural effusion, biopsy proven tubercular effusion, as well as a lupus pleuritis in a patient with an SLE flare. The importance of diagnosing this is if you have not diagnosed this and if you have put the patient on a pulse steroid and cyclophosphamide, the simple TB could have become a disseminated TB and you could have lost the patient. So what we did was we started this patient on steroids, we gave him we started the ATT as well, but we didn't pulse with steroids or we didn't start any sort of immunosuppressants. Two weeks we gave, the, gave this patient uh, ATT with some amount of steroids and after two weeks we pulsed the patient with steroids and we started immunosuppressant. And right now the patient is almost one year into follow-up with a complete remission of SLE. So whenever you have a clinical dilemma, always evaluate. Sometimes you may feel that you are over-evaluating a patient, but it may be life-saving in certain cases because you are your past experiences are your best teachers. If we, have not, if we have not been aggressive enough to make a diagnosis, probably we could have lost this patient with disseminated TB. As I was saying to you in the morning, you can see here this case was a case of a loculated empyema who was treated on empirical ATT. And then the patient came to us. But if you appreciate here, there is some element of a mediastinal pleural involvement. When we went inside with the thoracoscopy, as you can see from here, there are entirely studded pleural nodules. And what you got was calretinin and CK5 by 6 positive. And this was a case of a malignant mesothelioma. So not all fibrothoraxes or all, not all sorts of uh, loculated pleural effusions in India are tuberculosis. If you evaluate properly, especially when there is a mediastinal pleural involvement, you can still have mesothelioma even without an exposure to the asbestosis. So another area where we generally uh, play a very important role in interventional pulmonology is in a case of a central airway obstruction. And most of the central airway obstructions are treated as a case of a refractory asthma or a COPD. So this girl also, lady also presented to us with a central airway obstruction. And when we uh, presented to us as a refractory asthma, so when we did a CT scan, you can see that there is a big tumor which is sitting at the lower end of the trachea and almost causing a near total completion. And when we did a bronchoscopy, you can see a bilobed tumor which is present there. So we used the uh, electrosurgical instruments and the cryo to debulk these tumors and we attain a normal luminal patency and the patient is discharged the very next day. And in diagnosis, what you get is an adenoid cystic carcinoma. So whenever you have a patient who has got a asthma or a COPD which is non-responsive to treatment always suspect some element of a central airway obstruction. It can be carcinoid, it can be adenoid cystic, it can be mucoepidermoid, or it can be just a foreign body which the patient has not recollected that he has aspirated. So I'm not going through most of this in the interest of time. So another, another most important slide which I wanted to show you is this is a case which will teach you the importance of bronchoscopy. So this patient was having a mass-like lesion in the left lower loop. The patient go, had gone to a doctor. The doctor found out that he was having a pneumonia. He started him on antibiotics. Patient did not have any response and the lesion was persisting. Then the patient was put on empirical ATT, thinking that it is a tuberculosis without evidence. Patient started taking ATT, completed treatment of ATT. There was no response. Then they did a PET CT scan for this patient. It was pet avid lesion, so they did a PET-guided biopsy. Biopsy came out to be inconclusive. At this point of time, the patient was referred to us. When we referred to us, all that they could have done was a simple bronchoscopy, which they didn't do. So when we did a bronchoscopy, what it was was a simple uh, polypoid tumor, which was obstructing the subsegmental bronchus. And all that pneumonia, what you are seeing beyond this, is nothing but a post-obstructive pneumonia. So what we did was we took him for a debulking. We debulked the tumor, and we recanalized the airway. And what you got was an endobronchial lipoma. So if we have just done a simple bronchoscopy when the patient didn't respond to the initial antibiotics at the first point of time, you could have avoided an ATT, you could have avoided a PET CT scan, you could have, you could have avoided a CT guided biopsy. So always remember any sort of a non-resolving pneumonia or pneumonia occurring at a one particular subsegment repeatedly, then always suspect that, that there could be an endoluminal lesion and your bronchoscopy will really play an important role in arriving at a diagnosis. And just now we are having a discussion for fungus. So this is another interesting patient who is a 60-year-old male, alcoholic, dioptic, fever, cough, loss of weight, loss of appetite for one month, empirical ATT. You see a left upper lobe cavity, you go inside, you have a thick pus-like material, you take biopsy, you take aspirated, it's not coming out. So we took biopsy of this pus-like material, which was a mucus plug-like thing. And what it turned out to be was a case of a mucormycosis. So any patient with a diabetes or an immunocompromised condition, especially when they present to you with a mucus plug-like material in a bronchoscopy, which is very hard, suspect mucormycosis. It's very, very common. 
And this is yet another very, very interesting case. Uh, this probably one or two cases I'll stop my presentation. So this is a very, very interesting patient. The patient was a case of a known H1N1. The patient was referred to us in, with a desaturation of 89 percentage. So patient was started on fluvir and uh, supportive medications. After five days, patient fever subsided, counts are normal, but patient hypoxemia continued to persist, and patient was having persistent breathlessness. So we did a CT scan. This is the CT scan. What you are seeing is after 10 days of treatment, there is presence of bilateral pneumonia. Now we are in a dilemma whether what is this. So everybody thought it could be a case of a hospital acquired pneumonia because you have a CT scan which is suggestive of bilateral lung infiltrates and uh, uh, patient was um, uh, having a desaturation as well as breathlessness and cough. But we thought that patient is afibrile, counts are normal, why he should develop a hospital acquired pneumonia. So we said that we want to take this patient for bronchoscopy and biopsy. We took this patient for a bronchoscopy and a biopsy, and in biopsy what you can see is the meson bodies, which is nothing but a case of an organizing pneumonia secondary to your viral infection. If we have not diagnosed this, probably you would have started this patient on high-end antibiotics like a meropenem or a cholestin, thinking that it's a case of an hospital acquired pneumonia. Now the treatment is entirely different. We stopped all the antibiotics, we just started this patient on steroids, we discharged him, and after a week the saturation improved to 96% and the x-ray started showing signs of resolution. So whenever you have a viral infection, and if you feel that the patient is not toxic looking, and there is a radiological worsening, always suspect there could be a case of an organizing pneumonia. And many a times, but it is very tricky thing to just start these patients on steroids without doing a ball, because in case if it is, was a case of an infection and you have started these patients on steroids, the condition could have deteriorated. In addition to this, in certain cases, this is another rare presentation where the patient was having an ICD for one month and then referred to us with a BPF. There was a continuous uh, air leak. And when we did a CT scan, all that you are able to appreciate is a big bulla bilaterally with a residual pneumothorax. No surgeon will be daring enough to touch this patient for surgery because if you resect, there is nothing left. So the surgeon said that we cannot take this patient for any sort of a surgical closure. So we explained the high risk patient to the high risk to the patient, and then we took him for a bronchoscopic closure of BPF. So what we do is we go inside the bron with the bronchoscope into the airways. We occlude each of the subsegment to see from which subsegment the leak is occurring. Once we know from which subsegment the leak is occurring, we take some silicon spigots and we go there and we place it inside the particular spot from which the leak is occurring and we put a glue and then we come out so that the spigot stays in place. Once it is done, the patient was extubated from table and the very next day the BPF started slowing and after almost three days the BPF completely resolved. So in this case we could not have done anything else apart from a bronchoscopic closure. But it will not be always successful out of your 10 cases, 4 cases may be successful provided your leak is a localized leak. If the patient is leaking from multiple sites, then probably this may not work. So this is another uh, very, very interesting uh, case. So th this guy was having a carpenter, he was holding a nail in his mouth. So while doing the drilling, he aspirated the nail. What you are seeing is a nail. So this patient was roaming around like this for 4 to 5 days and he came all the way from Warangal. And what we did was we did a bronchoscopic extraction of a foreign body. So you can see from here, and the, the challenge in this case was that the foreign body went so distally that you cannot be see the foreign body with your routine bronchoscopy. So what we have to use is we use the C-arm because this foreign body is radio opaque. So we used the C-arm, we, we, we approached the foreign body blindly, and as you can see from here, we are using the forceps to retrieve the foreign body, and what you get is a, almost a five centimeter nail which was there in the airway foreign body. Sometimes your bronchoscopy can help in removal of a foreign body also. So I'll just finish with one case. I think Dr. Mishra will be laughing because this is a case which is very close to uh, all of us. So she is a 14-year-old uh, girl who has a case, uh, case of a diabetic ketoacidosis. I always end my presentation with this slide because this is something which, which is truly rewarding for you being as a physician and as an intensivist. So this, she was a 14-year-old girl. She was having a DKA and she, she was having a left lung pneumonia. And somebody in the peripheral center tried to put an uh, internal jugular vein onto the right side. And in that process, he created a pneumothorax. Now the patient was having a pneumothorax with an ICD on the right side. And there's a dense pneumonia on the left side. And the patient presented to us in the middle of the night, at a, in a Sunday night at around 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock around that time. With a 100% FiO2, the patient was maintaining a saturation of 82% and patient was requiring double vasopressor assistance. So we said to the attenders that you have to go in for ECMO because nothing else could save this patient. And they immediately agreed to go for ECMO. So we initiated this patient on ECMO. 
But the very next day, the attendees were like, uh, we don't have finances. So we have to decannulate this patient from ECMO. She was a 14-year-old girl. So we went, uh, we didn't have any other choice, but it was ethically and morally also, we were like very much drained, thinking about removing an ECMO from a 14-year-old girl who has got a bilateral pneumonia and double vasopressor assistance. So we requested the management, and uh, luckily the management said that for five days we will give them free of ECMO charges. So five days the patient was, uh, they didn't charge anything for the patient for ECMO. And meanwhile, we also started a little bit of crowdfunding from all the physicians in the hospital. And uh, we started uh, working on the patient. Lucky for her, on the fifth day, the patient came out from ECMO. And after that, the patient was slowly, the vasopressor assistance subsided. But in between, she had multiple episodes of VAP. And the patient also had uh, multiple episodes of DKA, which was corrected. And after almost uh, 10 to 15 days, she was uh, decannulated from the ventilator, but almost after 25 days, she was discharged from the hospital, and now she is leading a very happy life, and she is going back to school. The point of putting this slide is, if you choose the right patient for an ECMO, ECMO can really be life-saving. So, but the point is, when are you going to initiate a patient on ECMO? The moment you feel that the patient is not improving despite you proning the patient, or if you have a contraindication for proning, and if you are not able to maintain oxygen status for the patient, and before the patient develops some sort of an end organ dysfunction like a AKI or a cardiomyopathy or patient having a deranged LFT, that is the point if you intervene and if you really start these patients on ECMO, it can be life-changing for these patients. Because these pneumonias are temporary. So as long as if we buy time for the antibiotics to work and make the patient recover from the pneumonia, then we can really save the life of this patient. Thank you.